It is a real pleasure to have Paul Wong, who is the manager of the Sprott Gold and Precious Minerals Fund and also the Sprott Hedge Fund, with us today on Money Talk. How are you, Paul? Oh, I'm good, John. How are you? I'm okay because being a long-standing gold bug, it is certainly good after the five-year brutal bear market to have a gold and silver market that seems to have pretty good legs. Uh, yes, definitely, John. Things are progressing quite nicely in the precious metals area. Well, the last time we talked, your fund was well up on the year. And I guess where I'd like to start is you last week sent out a memorandum itemizing the reasons why we have a gold bull market on our hands. So Brexit happened. Obviously, the vote was was to leave. And so, you know, there's a number of indicators we track all the time. They have, uh, you know, quite meaningful impact on, on precious metals. And so I, I sent that a note last week in our commentary, and these are sort of the highlights we touched on. One one was the, the five-year tip seal. That's that's our primary indicator. And right now we're seeing the five-year tip seal testing the lows right now. It broke through it earlier this week. We're still likely to head down from there. So this is predominantly very gold bullish. second one would be the 10-year uh, government bond yields everywhere around the world. So we're just seeing you know rates heading to new negative territory. German 10 years broke down to about minus uh, 19 basis points right now. Japan, I think, was around minus 25 basis points. The real eye-opener for us was the, the Swiss bond yields. The 30-year went uh, negative, as did the 50-year, which is Incredible. So virtually the entire Swiss bond curve is now negative. All that is very bullish for gold. So earlier in the year, I think the high point was there's roughly about a 75% probability there would be another Fed rate hike in 2016. That's virtually off the table now. So the probability is somewhere around 0% for July, 0% for September. The U.S. election, so chances are the Fed will not act during the election period. So the earliest would be December, and right now that probability is sitting about 10%. It's virtually, there's almost no chance that there be a, a rate hike this year. And, you know, coming to 2016 and through the first early parts of 2016, one of the most significant negative potential for gold bullion was, was that of a rate hike, and that's, that's now gone. Other things we're looking at, we're, we're looking at credit default swaps in the European financials. So that's, that's you know, for the listeners, that's really, it's it's a measure of, of credit risk for the European financials. And they, they're widening, they're getting higher, still well below the January, February highs, but, you know, they're, they are widening and they're trending higher. So again, that's, that's gold bullish. We're also watching the yen. The yen strengthens. It's a measure of a risk off or a flight to safety type flow. So we're definitely seeing the yen strengthen today. It's it's uh, testing the, the 100 level right now. As we see. It's a very key level on the yen there. The currency volatility, you know, we're, we're seeing the pound continue to uh, make new lows. Virtually right now, the pound is almost in free fall. We're seeing a lot of movements in currencies around the world. So currency volatilities are very, very high. And again, that's a very important gold indicator for us as well. Everyone does tend to focus on the U.S. dollar, but long-standing, long-term correlation is that, you know, when the U.S. dollar is strong, gold tends to be weak. But there are periods in time when gold and the U.S. dollar actually do move together in one of those periods right now. So if you look at the uh, 30-day correlation between the U.S. dollar and gold, it's actually at one of the highest levels it's been in the last 10 years or so. And the reason is quite simple. It is is a, another flight to safety type trade. So, you know, one, one of the things driving gold right now is a flight to safety, whether you know, the flows are coming from uh, European or, and international holders. That's probably where more, more of the bulk of the flows are. We talked about ETF gold holdings, which is a significant buyer of gold bullion. And right now, the holdings are rising at its quickest pace since, since 2005. So there's a massive flow back to gold bullion. We talk about dollar basis swap, uh, which is, again, for listeners, it's, it's, it's a measure of liquidity. And right now they're widening, meaning liquidity is getting harder and harder to come by. So there's more stress in the system. And again, that's that's gold bullish. And probably one that's from an equity perspective, probably very meaningful, gold bullion. 
and measured in, in euros is broken out of a significant bullish pattern. Post-Brexit, you know, we're seeing a lot of European fund managers buying gold. So they're buying gold on their side of the world. So London listed, uh, South African listed names. They've had, you know, tremendous moves. They outperformed the, the North American comps considerably in the last week or so since Brexit. You know, we see huge volumes coming through. So a lot of the European fund buyers that were ignoring gold bullion and gold equities are, are now coming back to gold. So that's kind of a quick highlight of what we're seeing. You know, those are all very significant indicators, and, and virtually every one of them is pointing in a positive direction for gold. And what would be the weighting silver versus gold in your portfolio? Uh, right now, it's the silver is about a little bit over 20% of the portfolio. And could you explain for our listeners the gold-silver ratio, because you've got some pretty significant uh, numbers. Right. So if you look at gold divided by the price of silver, and if you go back 40 years, it tends to trade in a range of 80 times, like how many ounces of silver you can buy for every ounce of gold, that'd be 80 times, and the low would be 40. So recently we were trading in the 80 range, and that's the high end of the range, and now that it's starting to move. And we kind of expect, if again, if you look at the full 40-year history, it, it tends to oscillate between the two points. It doesn't really stop one way or the other. It's either trending strongly down or trending strongly up. So when you see the ratio compressed, that means that for every ounce of gold, basically it's, it's moving in favor of silver as the ratio goes lower. So as the ratio heads lower today, it's uh, very positive for silver. So you, know, you can pick up a lot more leverage with silver in a bull market move. So historically, if you look at silver, you know, you can pick up about 1.3 times the move on silver versus gold. And that's virtually for almost any time period. The, the actual number is like 1.3 plus or minus 0.1. Whether you use a 5-year, 10-year, 20-year, whatever, it doesn't matter. It, you do pick up a lot of uh, extra leverage and extra beta through silver. Is it fair to say that during the past five years, some of these shares, meaning the gold and silver shares, came down as much as 90%. And they, in the last nine months, are probably up about 100% or more in value. So that still puts a lot of these situations down 80%. So people look at the moves that have taken place and say, this is time to take a profit, but uh, this market looks like it can run a lot further on the upside. Yes. I call that what you just described, you know, a fun with math exercise. Again, it's just it's just the way the math works. So, you know, when you drop to that degree and any small movement off a very, very low base, you know, has huge percentage numbers. So what you need to do is you need to see, you know, the full price range of the movement and figure out where you are there from there. Uh, right now on a full complete cycle, you're about at the most one-third of the way through in a, in a full bull market cycle. So there's still room for upside. And that, that's assuming a normal cycle. So we have long-term databases going back to 1970. In 45 years, we, we measured seven complete gold uh, bull market cycles. On average, the, the bull market cycle tends to last about 3.6 years. And on average, it tends to go up about 360%. So even if we were average, you know, so we're about a third away there. So we're up about year to date. We're up about, you know, just a little bit over 100%. So, you know, most you can say is we're up a third. But every indication that we see today in the macro environment where the central banks are taking interest rates, i.e. the negative territory, you know, where we're seeing real rates going, this has all the markings you know, of extraordinary beyond average bull markets. So we think there's still a lot of upside left in the gold space, in the gold and the precious metals area. And if you want extra leverage, come back to silver. It's, it's, a, it's a great choice. And we have the backdrop of a competitive devaluation currency environment, which is now really beginning to take hold, particularly after Brexit. Yes. Well, another way of looking at it is, you know, negative interest rates is really it's just another form of competitive currency devaluation. We're, we're seeing, I guess, China was, you know, you know, headline news back in August of 2015, headline news in January of 2016, earlier this year. But a lot of people don't realize is that the yuan has been devalued significantly during the Brexit event. It's, it's just one of those things where, you know, they, you know, 
everyone's focused on one part of the world. Everyone's getting lost in the what's going on with the one. And it's it's actually devaluing at a very quick pace. The pace is actually equivalent to what we saw earlier in January this year. When when you know when that happened, it actually triggered a severe sell-off in the global markets. Today, I don't think hardly anyone even notices it. It will have an impact. And they've got the latitude for further devaluation because it's gone up a lot in the past ten years. And yes. I was recently in Shanghai for ten days. And there seems to be a new appetite for not only gold, but silver and Chinese buying is quite considerable as a way to get money not just out of the country, but into something tangible that's better than paper. Right. Uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing that effect virtually everywhere. Uh, when you, you think about it, uh, there, there probably isn't a single country on the planet that wants a strong currency. That's the nature of the world right now. There is absolutely no country on the planet that wants a strong currency. It's a country you just don't want to do that because there is a competitive advantage for you to devalue currency. This issue is the savers now. So if you're a saver in the country, you had a choice between owning your, your, your own local currency or gold bullion, you're better off. Like we have data going back 40-odd you know, years or so and the vast majority of time, you know, gold, on any lengthy time period, gold outperforms any local currency. It's just a question of degree. Now, I date myself because I go back 50 years in this business, so I did go through the 1970 cycle, and gold started at $40 an ounce and ended in 1980 at uh, $850 U.S. an ounce. And when you look at the fundamentals that is, the U.S.'s balance sheet and the condition of, of a lot of the central banks. It was much stronger in that era, and there seems to be ample reason for this move to continue, and I'm just reiterating the point that we now seem to be in a bull market. Yeah, definitely. There, there's ample move further upside. And just, just to reference it, even going back 10 years, we, if you track a basket of the nine major currencies, gold on average has outperformed the basket in the last 10 years. And this is the end of 2015, about 115%. And this year, I think the number is another 25%. So tack that on. You're, you're probably looking at you know, something in the, in the 135 to 140% range now. It is that significant. People tend to forget is that yeah, there, is a, there is a global worldwide currency devaluation going on. And I'm looking at the performance for your gold and precious minerals fund a year to date, and it's up about 107, well, 108 percent. And I should mention at this point that anyone who is interested should talk to their investment advisor and make sure that a holding suits their objectives and that they can sleep at night, but certainly the gains that have been achieved have compensated for losses in other areas during the year. You know, agreed. It's, you know, gold, again, it's, it's one of the very rare asset classes that offers a non-correlated return to the other asset classes. That's one of the key attractions of gold. When you get the timing right, which we think the timing is good, you know is, is very good near the beginning of a you know a new up cycle. Not not only do you get the advantage of a non quarterly return, but you, you get substantial you know up performance as well. So it, you know from that perspective, it's it is a unique investment, and it should definitely be considered. Well, Paul, as always, that's been really enlightening and. Thanks so much for joining us today on Money Talk, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon, and have a great weekend. Thank you, John. Have a good one, too. It was a pleasure talking to you. Stay with us, folks. After the break, we come back with David Prince, who is the founder and president of Harbinger Capital Markets Research, in conversation with Andrew Bell of our affiliate BNN.